time. So that way we have time for everything. Okay, so good evening, everyone. And okay, looks like a few more people logged in. Mitchell and Marina, welcome. And Gloria, Gloria, also long time no see as well. Uh, okay, great. And we have a, a phone on, 789, that's Erwin Needover. So I hope I've uh, acknowledged everyone's presence who is with us. Welcome, Jenny. And uh, let's begin. So last week, we were, right now we are on Gimel Ahmed Bays, actually. Technically, we made it to the top of Dalit Ahmed Alf. We made it to the top of 4A. But the thing is, our sugya, our topic about mikvaos, really ranges from the bottom of Gimel Ahmed Bays um, to about the middle or so of Dalit Ahmed Aleph. So what we're going to do actually is we're going to rewind a little bit. You know, imagine it's a TV show and we say previously on our weekly Talmud year. So we're going to do a little recap of what we ended off with. And that way we have the foundation to move forward and understand the rest of the sugya. How does that sound? Good. All right. I'm glad we're in agreement. So for those who are following who, uh, I guess you got the art scroll. It's probably, I'm imagining it's the last page uh, for 3B and it's, 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 3B to the fourth yeah, power. 3B4. 3B4. 3B to the fourth power. Got it. And if you're in the, in the text of the Gemara, it's four lines up from the bottom. I happen to have a little period in my Gemara. It's the middle of the line. The Amar of Yehuda, Amar Rav. And again, if you're on Safari, I can't really tell you where. But if you search the words, um, you know, a look, you'll probably find it more or less. Okay. So let's begin. Ah, so a little bit of background. Uh, so something good to know about how mikvos work. So does anyone recall what's the shear? How much water do I have to have in a mikvah in order for it to be kosher? What did we learn? Forty. 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 Yeah. Forty. Yeah. Very good. Forty. Uh. And again, I, I remember I read Rabbi Jackter article a while ago. He gives you more or less the precise fluid ounces. I'm not remembering offhand, but it's a substantial amount of water. I mean. Go to our mikvah. You'll see it's a substantial amount of water that you need for a kosher mikvah. I'm sure we do a little more than necessary. That way we play it safe. So here's the thing. Except for an aberrant opinion of the rivet we'll leave aside, the consensus is once a mikvah hits the requisite shear, the requisite amount of 40 sa'ah, I can pour disqualified water in there and it will not affect the kashras of the mikvah. It will become part of the mikvah and it will not render the mikvah non-kosher. Now, what could render a mikvah not kosher? Well, if you have something called maim shu'uvim, drawn water, mikvah water is either a spring or from rainwater. So either natural water from the ground or it's rainwater. But if I have maim shu'uvim, if I take my Poland spring water bottle, that it was drawn water, it's in a clean now vessel, and I pour it in, that water is disqualified for mikvos. So... What's the issue? If I have a 40 sum mikvah, it's not problematic. Well, here's the thing. If I don't yet have a kosher mikvah, if I'm only starting to make the mikvah, then if I'm in the middle of filling it up, let's say I only have 20 sa of water, I'm, I'm halfway there. If I put in three lugin of water, then three lugin will disqualify that entire mikvah. That's a small amount. Just again, to give you an idea what three lug is, I don't have the exact measurement offhand, but again, a revius of water is between three to four fluid ounces, more or less. And mm -hmm. so that's a revius of lug. That's four, a fourth of a lug. So multiply that by four, then multiply that by three, and that's that's what it is. So again, anyone who wants to do the math, you'll you'll let us know how much mm -hmm. that is in fluid ounces. So what our Gemara is going to deal with here is that premise. That's important to know. Three lugan. While you're middle of making a mikvah, you're not at the requisite amount yet, will disqualify the kashras of that mikvah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Anything on that that I could clarify before we jump in? Because the whole Gemara is predicated on that introduction. Okay, great. So let's jump right in. If I have three lugan, again, right, the three lugan of water that could disqualify a mikvah, and then I just put in a kortav. A kortav is a very minuscule amount of wine into those three lugan of water. And now this water has the appearance of wine. The water turns red. 
If that goes into a mikvah, it will not disqualify the mikvah. I wait a minute. You know, sure, there's wine in there, but there's also three lugan of water. Shouldn't the three lugan, ignoring the wine, disqualify the mikvah? Why do we care? What does this drop of wine do that changes everything? So, maskivla rav kahana b'chi ma bein zev le'meit seva. The tnan rabbi yosi omer meit seva posted as a mikvah b'shoshes lugan. How is this any different? We have a mishnah that tells us explicitly that colored water can still disqualify a mikvah. So, what makes water with wine different than water with coloration? Water with wine won't disqualify a mikvah. Water that's colored, maybe through dye or something else, that will disqualify a mikvah. What's the difference between the two of them? Amar le Rava, Hasa me ditseva mikri, Hacha kama meziga mikri, right? This was our, uh, our Boy Scouts example from last time, right? Remember the, uh, the, uh, the joke, again, not taking any sides politically, but just a good way to remember it. There's the classic uh, thing during a Q&A, someone asked Ben Shapiro, how do you know Boy Scouts are only for boys and not for girls? He said, it's in the name, Boy Scouts. So forget your opinions on it, but this helps for the next part of the Gemara. Also, my seva mikri. How do I know that colored water is still water and that uh, diluted wine is still wine? Because hasa my seva mikri. The dyed water is referred to as colored water. It's water that happens to be colored. Hacha chama maziga mikri. But over here. This wine that gets put into the water, it's not called colored water. It's called actually diluted wine. Therefore, since it is viewed as wine, you're not said to be putting water into the mikvah. You're putting diluted wine into the mikvah. And while diluted wine won't add, it won't contribute to the shear of 40 saw, to reaching the requisite amount of 40 saw, it won't detract from the mikvah either. It would not disqualify the mikvah. Um, so that is the first part of the Gemara there. We ran through it at the end of the last time, and uh, but I just want to make sure it's clear. Any questions on that? I, I found a footnote that gives the, the, the measurements. Ah, it okay. Says, the term kartav is used here to denote a minuscule amount. Technically, a kartav is 1 64th of a log, uh, which is... Uh, one quarter fluid ounce, mm -hmm. or one, if I can read the number this light. Well, a, qu a quarter fluid ounce. 190 seconds is the, is the of three wounds. What was that, Henry? 192. 192 what? 190 seconds of. This is the core wounds. tub, the defining the core tub, which is. Yeah. yeah, so again, it's, it's a. It, it's not a, it's clearly not a negligible amount, but it's a minuscule amount, mm -hmm. but it can have a significant impact. Okay, so good. So those are the measurements. Anyone who has the art scrolls, you uh, you probably have that in your footnotes there. So excellent. Uh, but Tony, but here's another question. Here's another challenge to our principle. So what do we say? Three lugan of water, but you would disqualify a mikvah, but you add a little bit of wine, it no longer has the potency to disqualify the mikvah. Here's the thing, though. Avatani Rabbi Chia Horidu as a mikvah. Avatani Rabbi Chia Horidu as a mikvah. Rabbi Chia ruled that such mikvos are disqualified. So why would he say that? What's the basis of the disagreement? Rav thinks that such a mikvah is still kosher. Rabbi Chia thinks that it's possible. What's the basis of their disagreement? So these are both Amorayim. The Gemara is going to tell us, actually, their dispute might be contingent on a machlok is a dispute among Tanayim that can be found earlier in a Mishnah. Amarava, lo kasha, ha Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri, ha Rabbanan. This is a machlok, is a dispute between Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri and the Rabbanan. It's none. Shloshes lugin maim chaser kortav, shenafa lesochan kortav yayin, omar ayin kemar yayin, venafala mikvah, lo pasluhu. If I have, now notice the word over here, this is important. If I have, let's say 2.9 whatever court, um, lugan of water, not three lugan, a little short of three lugan, and then it reaches the shear of three lugan by me adding in a little bit of wine, that would not invalidate the mikvah. 
The chain gimel lugin mayim chaser kortam shenafel asochan kortam chalav umari and kamara mayim shenafel mikva lo pasu. Same thing. You have almost three lugin of milk. Uh, sorry, of water. You add in a few drops, a little bit of milk, and that reaches three lugin. Also, that would not disqualify the mikvah. Now, that's the opinion of the Rabbanon. What's the inference I can make here? The inference is that had there been three lugin of water independent of the wine, independent of the milk, if you add in milk, you add in wine, it's going to still disqualify the mikvah. That's what's going to happen. Now, why is that the case? Because according to the Rabbanon, it's not about what this looks like. We don't care if it looks like wine. We don't care if it looks like water so much. The point is, is that there is a sheer. There is a quantity of three lugan. Anything else on top of that is not going to change things. If there is three lugan of H2O in there, it will invalidate the mikvah. That's the opinion of the Rabbanon. And now I know I made my own little chart here in the Gemara, which I'm going to refer to. But I took a quick look just out of curiosity. Apparently, Art Scroll creates a chart there as well. Um, I think they do, right? At least my edition that we have at home. If you look, maybe you have to flip uh, one or two pages, but on the bottom in the footnotes, yeah, yeah. I recall Art School had a um, had their own table, which might help if people look at that. But I'll do my best to explain. What was that, Toby? Oh, I'm saying what? it's on 4A to the second power. 4A to the second power. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so that's the opinion of the Rabbanon. Now I'll try to, for those who don't have the uh, the visual aid of Art Scroll, I'll try it. You know, apparently people have been learning this for ages before Art Scroll was created, so uh, it is possible to understand it without it. So I'll do my best to explain it. Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri Omer, after Hamare. It's not based on, you know, you could have three lugan even. It could be even three lugan of water, but if it looks like wine, it's not water anymore, and it won't disqualify the mikvah. So now here's what's important. Here's an important distinction. Rabbi Yochanan disagrees when it comes to wine. He doesn't disagree when it comes to milk because wine will change the appearance of the water. Milk does not change the appearance of the water. So actually, you know what's very interesting according to Rabbi Yochanan? If I have 2.9 whatever uh, lugan of water on its own, it would not be able to disqualify the, mik the mikvah. But the milk... Uh, in the words of Rashi, Havu luhu chalav. it will join together with the water and the chalav, the milk, will complete the quantity required, the three lugan of water, because the milk will not change the appearance. In fact, not only will it not change the appearance significantly, but it will contribute to the water hitting three lugan. That's what Rabbi Yochanan says. Mm. So Rabbi Yochanan is very lenient when it comes to wine, that if it's three lugan uh, and there's wine, it will not invalidate the mikvah. But he's very mock, he's very strict when it comes to milk, that if you have less than three lugan, not only will milk uh, uh, you know, be neutral, it's not even neutral, it will help the water disqualify the mikvah. I would so, think it would make the water cloudy. Um, so apparently the, the, you know, there's a very little bit of milk again, right? So we'll have to, you know, you know what, if this is like uh, you know, a practicum class we're doing, we, someone could bring in, like, get some milk and water. And if anyone has, you know, I see some people at kitchens in the background. If anyone wants to do an experiment for us right now, that's okay. Uh, but, you, you know, hopefully everyone, you can experiment after the shear. We'll get you the exact fluid ounces. You'll take a quart of a milk. You'll take uh, the, the 2.9 so lugan of water. You'll mix it together and see what happens. You'll, you'll report back to me. But apparently the Gemara believes that there's not going to be a significant difference. Okay. So now what does this mean for us? Well, now we understand the basis of Rav. Remember before Rav said, if you have three lugan of water plus wine, it will not invalidate the mikvah. Who does Rav fit according to? Rav is in accordance with Rav Yochanan ben Nuri. Because Rav Yochanan ben Nuri <coughs> says, Hakol hamare. It's all based on what I see. If I'm looking at water, it's water. If it looks like wine, it's wine. Then. It's diluted wine. So that is in accordance with Rav and Rav Yochanan and Nuri agree with each other. <laughs> but Rav would be at odds with the Rabbanan in the Mishnah because the Rabbanan and the Mishnah say, once you have three lugan of water, even if you add wine, game over. The mikvah is disqualified. So that is what we got up until this point. Okay, let me just, if there's any uh, strictly clarification questions that I can take. 
Is there anything unclear that I could clarify at this point? Okay, I'm glad we understand this because we're gonna now complicate things even a little bit more. I remember once year I said that like one, one thing was like the most complicated sugya in Makos. Like there's a few complicated sugyas right at the beginning that try like, you know, uh, maybe you're not allowed to say this nowadays, but to separate the men from the boys, so to speak, and the girls from the women, however you want to put it. So there's like a few of these at the beginning. So here we go. What we're going to report now is that there's actually a second reading, a second way to understand the disagreement between the Rabbanon and uh, Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri. Now, what's a different way to, to change this? So you remember in the Brisa before, if you look literally the first word on Dalam Rav, it says Chaser Kortav. So what if we, what if according to some versions, it didn't have the word Chaser, missing a Kortav, um, but actually it was three complete Lugan and doesn't need that additional Kortav. That's what we're going to do right now. So Hamibai Bai La Rav Papa, we're uh, about six lines down on Dalam Rav. So Rapapa had an inquiry. He's a little bit uncertain about the text of this Mishnah. Rav Tani Chasar Kurta Veresha. So Rav's text may have been that it said Chasar Kurta, that there is not three lugin of water when the Rabbanan were saying, when the Rabbanan were saying that it would not disqualify the mikvah. But as we explained before, now the Gemara is saying it, if the inference is that if there were three lugin of water, the rabbis would say it disqualifies the mikvah. And it comes along Rabbi Yochanan and tells us everything's based on sight, on appearance. The Rav Omer, Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri, and Rav is in accordance with Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri. That's exactly everything that I said outside. That was what the Gemara just said now. O Dilma, maybe there's an alternative way to understand its machlokis. Maybe Rav Lo Tani Chasar Korta Veresha. Maybe Rav's understanding of the Mishnah, his text, did not have the word Chasar in there. Rav Yochanan ben Nuri ki polig asefahu de polig. What's Rav Yochanan arguing on? He's only arguing when it comes to milk. The Rav de Omar Kedivrei Akol. And Rav is really in agreement with both Rabbanon and Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri. Now, let's take a step back and outside and unpack what that means. So here is the alternative way to understand the Machlokis. Let's say the mission did not have the word Chaser. So what's the case? The Rabbanon say, if there are three Lugin of water and you add a quart of, of uh, an extra quart of, of wine in there, it will not disqualify the mikvah. Same thing with uh, milk. If there's three lugan of water and you put the milk in there also, um, also it, when it comes to milk, so it depends. The milk will actually remain the same. When it comes to milk, it still needs to be 2.9 kortav. But according to Rabbanon, the Rabbanon are willing to be moda. They're willing to change your shita a little bit according to Rav, that if you have three lugan of water, and you add wine into there, even the Rabbanon, who usually say, as long as there's three Lugan, game over, actually, even they would concede to Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri that if as the appearance of wine, it will not invalidate the mikvah. So that actually fits with Rav as well. So the only thing that the Rabbanon and Rabbi Yochanan are really arguing about has nothing to do with wine. Everyone agrees, Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri and the Rabbanon, even if there's three lugan of water, if it has the appearance of wine, it will not disqualify the mikvah. What are they arguing about? Their argument is li more limited in scope. Their argument is just about when you have 2.9 core tubs and you add milk to it. So according to Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri, he says the same thing as before. The milk will not be neutral. The milk will actually contribute and create three lugan of water. Whereas the Rabbanans say, no, it needs to be three lugan of H2O. It cannot be milk in there as well. That's what they're arguing about. But perhaps everybody agrees that if you have three lugan of water, even three lugan, and you add in wine, it will not invalidate the mikvah. So why does Rav need to be lined up? Why does he need to be pigeonholed into Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri's shita? Really, he fits according to Rav and Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri, perhaps. 
That's what Rav Papa is suggesting. Okay. Any, so that's another possible reading. Is there anything I could do to, I, this, this is like really complicated here. I, I'm going to admit that. This is kind of like, I had to sit down and work it through myself. Uh, Jenny. Does it matter if it's white wine or red wine? Ah, very good. Someone asked that last time, I remember. I forgot who asked it, but who was it? Zadie asked it. Zadie yeah. asked it. Zadie asked the same question. So Zadie and Jenny asked the same question. So we're talking about red wine because I think you're right. The same thing would apply. I think white wine would be in the same category as milk. In fact, I think it would even make less of a dent uh, of coloration in the water. Again, we need to experiment at home, you know, uh, take out your wines and take out your, your water. And, uh, you know, this is a good, if I was like a classroom teacher in high school and, uh, you know, I was giving a class every day on this topic, like one day I would just bring in all these materials and do it in front of the class. Uh, but I'm sure we could, our imaginations will hopefully suffice. But then we're Again. wasting wine. What was that? Then we're wasting wine. Wasting of wine. Well, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be actually a waste if it's serving a purpose. We, 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 we tried that years ago. There's a Gomorrah in Beitza, the Shinoda Bianta, whether it's mux or not, what could you use the egg for? So the Gomorrah said you could use it to support a bed. No one knew what that means. This was in high school. We, we brought eggs into the classroom and, and tried to experiment, you know, the, with the desks that made a mess on the floor. So I don't know if it's a good <laughs> So yeah, those, those are fun. You know, it'd be crazy to go into Masechus Gitin and Avodazar, another place where I have all the Rafua Kamars and you say, you yeah. hang a chicken on the left door over there, it'll heal you from your headaches or something. You know, there you go. All sorts of weird medical advice that uh, it wasn't just what the rabbis believed. That was the common knowledge of their days. That's what the scientists back then said or whatever they had. So, you know, it's a lot of fun material to experiment with, which was... I'm sure debunked. Okay, so things get simpler from here on out. So if you if uh, you got what we got until now, it's easy sailing, smooth sailing from here. If you didn't quite get it as much, well, the rest of this should hopefully be more straightforward. And I'm happy to go back and work with anyone understanding this. So, ah, so the question is why with Rav Papa, it was very unclear what the gear so what the text was of this Mishnah. Uh, let's see, where do we leave off? Ah, Rapapa mi vaile, the Rav Abshitale. Okay, Rapapa, he needs to get his records in order, but Rava, he was very confident in his reading of the Mishnah. So Rava still believes that the Rabbanan, uh, the Rabbanan say three lugan of, of water, game over, even if there's wine. So according to Rava, Rav needs to be aligned with Rav Yochanan ben Nuri. Okay. I'm Rav Yosef. Now, this is important to know. Rashi points this out, that Rav Yosef Rav Yosef was a great scholar, but later in life, he forgot uh, something happened to his health, and he forgot much of what he learned. So what would happen is his student, Abaye, many times would remind Rav Yosef about what he taught Abaye previously. So we're going to see that dynamic here in the Gemara. I'm Rav Yosef, lo shmi hash maisa. I don't, I don't really know which way we should learn this Mishnah, with the word chaser or without the word chaser. You taught this to us. This is what you told us. The Rav lo tani chaser korta beresha. You taught us like the second reading that omits the word chaser and that the Rabbanan and, and uh, Rav Yochanan ben Nuri are in agreement that wine will prevent the water from disqualifying the mikvah. Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbanan, they only argue when it comes to milk, whether milk will combine with the water or not. Rav, Tamar Kedivrei Kol, and therefore, Shalma Yisrael, Rav, it's, Rav is in accordance with the Rabbanan, Rav is in accordance with Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri, because they all agree when it comes to wine, they only argue when it comes to milk. Rav's statement was only about three lugan with wine. Therefore, Rav is in accordance with both opinions in the Mishnah, according to Abaye in the name of Rav Yosef. Okay, end of that piece. We're going to have one other mikvos piece, but this one is much more straightforward. So let's jump right into that. Uh, okay, and then I'll, I'll have a, uh, a Hilchus Pesach point that I want to bring up, Halach Lamaisa, which I think will be interesting. Henry knows what I'm talking about because he was in shul. He, he, heard, it, he heard the beginning in between Milcha Marf. I made a preview. Uh, so we'll get the answer tonight. We're, we're in the middle of the page. I can't even see how many lines up or down. It looks like we're smack in the middle. 
If let's say you go to the Mediterranean Sea, you go to, um, you know, the separate beach of Tel Aviv and you pour a little bit of wine into the water over there. And then immediately you go ahead and you want to be Tovel in the sea over there. You know, the sea is, uh, is like the first mikvah ever made, right? It's, a, it's the world's most natural mikvah. Best mikvah you could use. When I go to Bayswater, where, uh, where my grandfather lives. So there, it's called Bayswater because there's a bay. So we'll go there and uh, that's where we'll tovel our dishes. So, uh, you know, it's very easy in Bayswater. You don't even need to bring things to the Kayla mikvah. You just drive right up to the water. You put things in. You hopefully don't get attacked by a flock of geese. And then you make your escape. So let's say you pour a little bit of wine into the sea over there. So if you pour in, oh, sorry, my mistake. Not wine. The next, the next part is wine. If you take, let, let me just rewind. I jumped ahead a little bit. The case here is, again, I take three lugan of water. Three lugan can disqualify uh, a mikvah, and I pour it into, right, let's say, you know, I have this devious idea. I want to try to disqualify all the water in the world, right? So I'll pour the three lugan into the water in the sea, and then I am tovel, I immerse myself in there. So, you know, either I'm putting a kli in there, or I'm tame, uh, someone, you know, is a nida, they want to make sure that they're tahor, tahora now. So the water will not effectuate a tahara process. I will go in their tame, impu spiritually impure. I will come out still tame. Why? Because we're afraid that the three lugan of water stayed where I put it in originally. And by the way, this only applies dafka. I mean, Bayswater water actually is a great example. It's a bay. This applies to the Mediterranean, apparently a certain area of the Mediterranean, because the waters there are very much stagnant. And we're concerned that in stagnant waters, the three lugan of, of disqualified water will stay in its place. The three lugan will stay in its place. And when I go into that water, the issue is when I immerse myself in the mikvah, I have to go completely into the mikvah. Every inch of my body needs to come in contact with the water. I mean, not inside my mouth, that's be Roy Libilo. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. But I have to basically, the whole external part of my body, everything needs to be touching the water. So if my body is partially immersed in three lugan of Mayim Shu'uvim of disqualified waters, it can't be said that I'm fully immersing in kosher mikvah water. That is an issue that comes up in stagnant waters. And Tanya Nami Haki, we have a brisa that gives us a very similar case. Again, another older, earlier Taniyitic source, which we cite as precedent. Tanya Nami Haki, Chavis Malaya Yain, Shnafa Liyam Hagadol, Hatol Sham Lo Oso Lo Tfila. That if I have a, uh, a barrel full of wine that falls into the Mediterranean Sea, if I immerse in there, my tvila is ineffective. My immersion does not work. Why? Same concern. We're concerned that I'm partially immersing in wine. I'm not completely immersing myself in water. Um, the next few words actually should be taken out of the Gemara. It doesn't fit in. From Chayshin uh, L'Shol Yeshuv and Shol Yibam What's his name? The, the Maram actually takes it out. I'm not going to explain, but basically these words don't fit the context here because it talks about water and not wine. The chain kikar shall true much Now here's the interesting thing. If I am tame, now the wine is tahor. The wine is spiritually pure. But if I then go in and we're concerned that I am, I am impure and I am touching that wine, I'm going to render that wine tame as well. So what's the issue if the wine is tame? Well, if I take a piece of truma, Truma is a gift that's given to the Kohanim. It's given to the priest. Uh, so, right, Zaidi and uh, all of our other numerous Kohanim that are with us today. So, they get Truma back in the good old days. So, the Truma, though, is not supposed to become Tame. It's supposed to remain Tahor because it's a holy food. So, if I put some Truma in that water right after I immersed in it, the Truma also will be halachically rendered Tame 
because I went in, we're concerned that I, that some of the liquid there is wine I touch. I render the wine tummy. And then when I put Truman there, which was tower, it was great. It also is going to contract the tuma from it and it's going to become tummy. It's going to become spiritually impure as well. Now, my okay. what's the Kiddush? I mean, if you tell me that we're concerned the wine is there and if I go in, I'll render it impure. What's the Kiddush? What is the Gemara? What's the rice coming to tell me that if I put anything else in there, it'll also become tummy. I could infer that from the fact that my tefillah didn't work because we're afraid that I'm touching the wine. So what would have I said? Hosom uki gavra achazoke, hocha uki truma achazoka, kamash molon. What would have I said? I would have applied the principle of chazaka. What's the principle of chazaka? The idea that we assume when there's a suffix, generally we assume if there's a doubt, we rely on the step, we keep things in the status quo. So this comes up in monetary law many times. We see how Mozi Michavero Olav Harayim. If uh, Ruven and Shimon get into a dispute, Ruven claims that Shimon's uh, computer belongs to him. Well, until Ruven can bring valid admissible proof to based in that that computer belongs to him, or you know, let's say they're arguing over a car. So until he could present the deed to based in, and prove that's his out of in a case of doubt. Um, kama. We leave it inside the we leave it with the person who currently is holding it because we keep the status quo until we have a significant reason to change the status quo. And that's a I mean, I think that's a very logical idea. Uh, we didn't necessarily need halacha to come along and tell us that. So, what's the chiddush over here? What we're learning here is that we don't rely on a chazaka. So I would have said, if we have a doubt over here, we don't know if the wine is the, the wine is still in the place that I poured it in. So if I Moshe Kurtz, I am Tame. Uh, you know, I, I came in contact with a dead body. I need to go to mikvah now. So if I want to immerse in there, there's a doubt. There's a suffix if I am immersing in water completely or if I'm partially immersing in wine. So because there's a suffix, because there's an uncertainty, we maintain the status quo. We maintain that I am still Tame until we could conclusively prove otherwise. Even though so, you say suffix, you're right to Lachomra in a case like that? Even though what? It, even though you might say that the that, that suffix, if it's a, the right to Tuma, that, it's, that you go Lachomra, even though the Chazaka would override that? The Chazaka... But so you're saying the Gemara shouldn't be saying, you're saying that he should be Tahor? No, he should be Tame. Oh, you, you, okay. If it's a Suffolk, you'd say Suffolk, yeah. you write the Lachumra, right? And that is, that is what the Gemara is saying. That's not the Chiddush. The Chiddush, oh. the novelty here, is that the Truma has a status quo of being Tahor, of being spiritually pure. And I would think if there's a doubt whether there's Tame wine there or not, we should maintain the status quo, the chazaka, that the truma remains tahor <coughs> until I can conclusively prove otherwise. So that's, <coughs> excuse me, that's what the Bryce is coming to tell us. That this truma, I would have said that the truma should be now spiritually pure and maintain the status quo. Because I don't know if the tummy wine is still in that quadrant of the water. But nonetheless, comes along the chachamim and they say, that we treat it as tummy now, even in the case of suffix. <coughs> now, why? Why in the case of suffix is it different? So there's two opinions. One opinion given is, um, let's see, I have it up over here. There are two opinions why that's the case. Opinion number one is that um, in Shir Rabbi Shmuel, it says that it's just a chumrah. Really? You're right. The truma should still be tahor. <coughs> But the Chachamim, the rabbis, were very careful when it came to the laws of truma. And they said, even in a case of suffix, in case of doubt, the truma will become tummy. So, okay, there's nothing, nothing really special. It just means that it's a chumrah. It's a stringency that the rabbis created. But the other opinion is a little bit more lumpish. Uh, I'll just finish this thought, and then I'll, then I'll take your point. Um, the other idea, which is given, that there's some of Farshim who say, since the beginning of this discussion was through the perspective of the person who was immersing himself 
And there we said that the wine uh, is probably there and will, re and will render him still tame. Therefore, at the end of the case also, since we already ruled that we're concerned that the wine is there, we're also concerned still there for the truma. But let's say we took the man out of the equation, there were just wine over there that, that was tame, and then you pour the, you put the truma in the water, the, wa the truma might still be tahor. It's only because we said, because we first had to analyze the case of the man going in there to immerse himself, that we rule that the wine is there and tame, it's gonna rent, keep him tame, so do we say the same thing for the truma? Okay, that's an additional thought, but it sounds like, uh, Phyllis, you have a question? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of surprised when that barrel of water drops into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, what happened to the, to, to the three uh, Lugin? I mean, the Mediterranean Sea is a vast mm -hmm. body of water. I could understand if they were talking about a pond or a lake, but a sea? Ah, very um, good. I don't, so, I don't get it. So, Frecht Phyllis Akasha. Phyllis asked the question that's bothering all the Rishonim here in the Sugya. And this brings us into a practical question that we have. So, to answer this question, I want to present another question. Very Jewish, I know. So, the question is if this is true, that we're concerned that three Lugan of water is going to stay where I poured it, the issues can become cataclysmic. Imagine this. Imagine you go to the Kinneret. The Kinneret is a huge lake in Israel for uh, those of us who are not familiar. And it's Pesach time. Somebody pours in whiskey, scotch into the Kinneret. Now, am I, let's say, I mean, I, I wouldn't actually drink from the Kinneret because a lot of people bathing in there. So I personally wouldn't. Well, is it now usser, the entire Pesach for me to drink from the Kinneret because there's a little bit of whiskey somewhere in there. Am I, do I have to go to the opposite side of the Kinera now to make sure I'm not drinking any of that whiskey? I mean, like Phyllis, you're, Phyllis, exactly what you're saying. Let's bring this to its logical conclusion. I mean, I shouldn't be able to drink from the Kinera on Pesach if someone pours in a, a jaw, you know, some wild turkey. Well, that's bourbon, uh, maybe not as bad. As, as, you said pours before, in as you said before, you shouldn't drink at all at any time from the Kinera. <laughs> well, from a health perspective, but what about strictly from a legal halachic perspective? Hilchus Pesach. What about from a regular kosher perspective? You yeah. have no idea what a ham sandwich yeah. could have been put in there. A ham sandwich could have been put in there. Yeah. Excellent. So now, what would you all say? Oh. Basic kosher knowledge here. Why would you think it wouldn't be a problem in general for the ham sandwich? Well, why are we well, talking well, about well, eating? Well, why well, not well, just well, bathing? Well, let's do one at a time. Okay. <laughs> Henry, Henry Toby, yeah. Jenny, and Phyllis. So, so the ham sandwich would be bottle, but but the uh, chametz is us served even in a uh, bamashu, even in an infinitesimal right. amount. Right. Okay. Very good. Uh, yeah. Is that is that what you were all going to say, Toby, Jenny, Phyllis? Yeah. Well, why are we I talking about eating? We're, we're, we're talking about immersion. You all, so, so Toby and Jenny, you'll 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 get credit for it. Phyllis, is there something? Yeah, know? we're not talking about eating. We're talking about immersing. Oh, about... it's the same. So it's the same. Okay, good. I'll clarify. It's, it's the same not... issue at hand. The same issue. The principle of the matter is that when it comes to immersion, the concern is that the liquid remains in the same place that you put it. The concern with drinking, again, is that the liquid stays in the same place. Uh, so we're talking about two different actions, but the same issue is at hand. The principle is that we believe that the liquid doesn't move too far from where you poured it in. It's so as Henry be... rightly, as Henry rightly pointed out. In general, right, in Jenny's case, you put some non-kosher food in there, great. It, it's bottle barov. There's way more water than there is of any of like that non-kosher beverage liquid that you put in there. It's not gonna be an issue. But the issue that Henry points out is that we have a principle that when it comes to Pesach, chametz is also a feel b'mashuhu. That even a little bit, we don't say bottle b'shishim, we don't say one to 60 ratio, it'll be okay. Even a little smidgen of chametz, a little quart of a chametz, gets found inside that measurement and you have a lot of water, it doesn't matter. The entire beverage is now considered chametz. That's a special rule when it comes to Pesach. Why is that? There's a lot of lumbus about that. But let's just assume that it's a chumrah midrabanan. That's a rabbinic stringency when it comes to Pesach. By the way, we'll have to schedule halach lamites this year when it comes to Pesach. But just because chametz can aser in mixture with even a little bit of chametz doesn't mean also that you'll be violating the Isser Ba'ir Ba'imatse of having chametz inside your household. 
if there's only a mashu of you don't need to actually if there's like little crumbs of chametz on the floor you don't have to have anxiety trying to pick up every last crumb it needs to be at least a kezayis uh it needs to be like you know like a little piece of a real piece of something it can't just be little crumbs so i mean you might want to clean crumbs up just to be clean in general but uh from a halakhic perspective you don't need to cause yourself so much agma snefesh and anxiety trying to get every last crumb off the floor but if that little crumb does go into your food, then it could actually oscar all the food. I just assume that most crumbs are on the floor are not finding their way into my cake. Uh, that, that's, I think that's a fair assumption. Maybe. Uh, hopefully not. Then there's health issues as well. So what is the answer to this question? Pesach presents an even bigger issue. So Rav Zilberstein, the Chashuke Chemed, he says it's based on three different opinions in Rishonim, how to understand why, why in the world do we think that the liquid is going to stay, that the wine is going to stay in that exact place that I put it in? It's going to spread throughout the water, even if the water is stagnant. What am I concerned about? So there's three opinions. The Ravon says that actually, if you wait a, like 30 minutes or an hour, you wait a significant amount of time, you actually could assume that the liquid is already uh, dissipated and spread to all Arba Kanfu Saaretz that's spread all throughout the entire water. So if you wait for the whiskey to just dissipate a little bit, you actually would be allowed to drink from the water over there. And what about, and then the other opinion is that what's the case of the Gemara where you gently put the liquid into the water? You have a barrel, then you unplug the barrel in the water and it stays right where it is. But if you pour into the water with force, of course it'll spread around due to the impact. And the third opinion, is that, again, you know, we need to do a science experiment for it, but when it comes to the Yam HaGadol, the Mediterranean, which is salt water, uh, something sweet, like, uh, you know, something sweeter would not mix, the wine would not mix with the water so well. But uh, something like the Kinaret, for instance, which is a sweeter kind of water, the wine will dissipate in it faster. Is that scientifically true? I have no clue. But apparently the Ritva thought so. So um, again, you know, this is uh, something that if I were uh, working at a school, I do like a cross uh, collaboration with a science teacher. And, you know, that'd be like a whole class for a day or something, a whole symposium. But uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll get together. If anyone wants to do it sometime, we'll, we could get together or you could do it in your kitchens and report to me what happens. If anyone has like a, a key narrative in the back of their kitchen. I, I, I might point out that uh, whether it's the Mediterranean or the Canarid or any substantial body of water, they are not stagnant. They're always in motion. Right. So I think the question is how significant the motion is. So even right, even if like there's always little waves going around, is that significant enough that's going to make all of that liquid dissipate? That's that's a question. But Zadia, that is, of course, I, I, that is true, that there's always going to be some form of force in motion just by virtue of fish being in there, people, anything. It's going to cause... There are currents. Currents, there, yeah, exactly. exactly. Layback, there are currents. Right, right. Yeah, it is a little weird with the Mediterranean because I, I do remember there being waves, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm not sure why, why the Gemara describes it as stagnant. Ah, so now back to our question. That's all fine and dandy. But what about uh, on, on Pesach? Again, on Pesach, Hari Chomets of Pesach also a field of like Henry pointed out. Even a little smidgen of Chomets. The entire Kinneret should now be Osir on Pesach. And you put a little bit of whiskey into the Mediterranean. Well, that's connected to all the oceans of the world. Shkayach, someone with a few drops of whiskey, just rendered all the waters of the ocean and everything connecting to it, usher to drink from on Pesach, right? Not that anyone's drinking salt water thing, but just like imagine it. Isn't that crazy? So there's an answer to this question. There's a few answers, but the main one really is, is that the principle that chametz is oser afiba mashahu, that even a little smidgen of chametz can render an entire uh, beverage oser on Pesach. It'll be chametz on Pesach. That is a rabbinical stringency. So there's a, uh, a classic principle, hey mamru hey mamru. The rabbis giveth, the rabbis taketh. So the same way they have a right to institute a stringency, they could also revoke it when they choose to do so. So when there's something called which is sometimes the rabbi said, really, we would love to institute something, but we know the community is not going to be able to handle it. So therefore, we are not going to institute this or arguably, we don't have the power 
to institute such an enactment. It's, it's, it's an interesting point. So when it comes to rivers, and according to some opinions, even according to well, even for wells, which are somehow connected to natural water sources in the world, those sources of water, since they're needed by everybody, will not become Asar on Pesach. Otherwise, you know, before you could have bottled water, um, if somebody wanted to be a jerk and just render the town well, Chametz uh, on Pesach, no one would have anything to drink. That'd be crazy, right? So Chametz said, you know, maybe when it comes to your cake, if a little bit of Chametz gets in, the whole cake will be Asar. But you can't just put a little bit of whiskey into the Kinneret and then render the entire Kinneret Chametz. That doesn't happen. But you know, if you if you really you know, if someone was like a trickster and uh, wanted to pull a, a prank on the entire Jewish nation, uh, and that rule was not in effect, it caused some very serious damage, right? Okay. Um, were there any other questions or thoughts before we go on to the Mishnah and conclude the Shia for tonight? Anything else I could clarify? Any thoughts or insights that you want to share? Okay, great. Again, it's one of those things that I, I, I hope was clear. I know we ran through it quickly, but hopefully it was beneficial. Now, somebody, I think uh, Howard, uh, Howard Weiss, you said last time that, what does this all have to do with Makos? And the answer is none of this has anything to do with Makos. But if you remember, we had a statement from Rav that was relevant to Makos. And then the Gemara said, let's go deeper down the rabbit hole and just share miscellaneous teachings from Rav. And that's how we had this whole entire sugi about Mikvos. Well, guess what? It's about time. We decided we missed Makos, we missed the good old lashes, and we are getting back on track. So you thought we were learning Makos? Well, we're getting back to Makos, so not to worry. So we are up to the Mishnah. The Mishnah, well, you can see, is toward the bottom of the page with the words Masnisim. So remember, remember we had our good old friends, the Edom Zomamin, the perjurious witnesses, and we learned that if two witnesses are found to be Adam Zomamin, they get the punishment that they sought to accuse, that they accused the defendant of. Again, there are certain conditions to make it happen. We'll talk about that more again later. Now, let's say they testified that Reuven owes Shimon $200. And then what happens is they become Adam Zomamin. So now they owe Reuven $200 collectively. Not only, according to Ramir, this is the minority opinion. I want to preface before we get all confused. The minority opinion, which I did not bring up in previous year because we don't pass like this, says not only do you have to pay the 200 Zuz that you accused him of owing Shimon, but you will also get 39 lashes along with it as well. We give you a double whammy. Why? Because the source that causes you to have to pay 200 zuz is not the same pasuk that makes you get 39 lashes. And remember, we talked about this in the past. There are two sources for false witnesses. The first source is a generic one, the ninth commandment, that you shouldn't lie in Basin, you shouldn't lie in a Jewish court. So, when it, so that is a generic 39 lashes. But if you became Adam Zomamin, if you are proven to be lying, consp conspiring witnesses through Adam Zomamin, remember Adam Zomamin, you were with us in California when that happened in New York, and so we could testify, and you become Adam Zomamin as well. Well, Adam Zomamin has a special punishment that it's uh, it's the Bockard punishment. You get you takes the form of whatever you tried to cause to the uh, whatever you tried to cause to the uh, defendant. So according to Rabbi Mayer, it's not either or. Why not both? After Lakaim Shneim, you could get Malchus because of Losana, because of the ninth commandment, and you could get also have to pay 200 Zuz because of being Adam Zomamin. We give you both. That's what Rabbi Mayer suggests. We do not hold like this, however. No, once you're paying, you don't get Mal excuse me, you don't get Malchus. Once you pay, once you pay 200 Zuz, Adam Zomamin, the parsha of Adam Zomamin, overrides the generic 39 lashes. Remember, that's what we've been assuming until now. That's what the Chachamim say. You get either one or the other. We'll learn it next year. The principle is called Kidei Risha. So you only get punished for one Risha, for one evil deed. You don't get two punishments for only doing one evil deed. 
So why are they bringing this up now and not before? Because, well, before when? Uh, previously, when we discussed this about the so, so what's important and the to mind, versus the, the, I'll keep uh, What's important to keep this in mind, Phyllis, is that this is only um, it's our third, our fourth Mishnah. So the way the Mishnah was composed, and uh, you know, uh, like on Fridays, uh, you know, I know uh, Gloria and Marina are with us on Fridays. Maybe some other people, you'll forgive me for not giving you a shout out. But on Fridays uh, before Shabbos, we do uh, Mishnayos Makos. So if you just learn Mishnayos, you're learning one after the other after the other. You don't have all these sugyas about mikvos and prusbol, shviyas, all that fun stuff in between. So if you were just reading through the Mishnayos alone, you took away all the Gemaras in between, you'd be up to this Mishnah in your first night of Shir. You'd be up to this okay. in two seconds. Yeah. So really, you would learn all this information yes. really fast. Okay. I had to give all the background information because I knew that would be a few weeks until we got to Dalai Lama and Aleph. But really, the intention is that you go through all Mishnayos first, and then later you learn all the Gemaras. But alas, we don't all have the luxury of doing that. But uh, that, that, that's why. That's why I waited until now. It's not really waiting until now. The Talmud assumes that you've already learned all Shishi Surah Mishnah, that you've learned all Mishnayos already. That's why, that's why it starts in Makos, uh, from Sanhedrin. That you know assumes that you learned Sanhedrin already as well. Okay. Now we have a similar case with the same principle at the end of the Mishnah. Let's say, let's make it interesting. What if we testify that the defendant committed a sin that would incur Malchus, that would incur 39 lashes? Now what happens to Coin Rai Mayor? Well, Loken Shmonim. Then you get 80 Malchus. You get two sets of Malchus. Mishum, why? Here, now it's explicit. Mishum lo son of Reacha age shaker, because you shouldn't be a false witness. And Mishum lo son of Reacha zamam, because of Eidim Zomim, the very mayor. You get the generic 39 lashes for lying in court, and you get another 39 lashes for being Eidim Zomim, because you accuse the defendant of doing something that would incur 39 lashes. So what do you get? You get two sets of 39 lashes. Because of the Sabri Akai Shakir, and because of Asisim Lokashir Zamam. Divri Raimir, that's a Pini Raimir. Same principle again. You, we just get punished for both Sukim. But for Chamomrim, ain't Lokal Arabaya. No, you only get one punishment. So you only get Adam Zomam in punishment when you qualify for that status. You don't get the generic Losan of Rechei Shakir. So you only get one set of 39 lashes, the same way you would only pay 200 Zuz. If that's what you accused of, accused the defendant of. Okay. And that brings us precisely to Baal Dalim and Aleph. And next time we will open up with the Gemara elaborating on this Mishnah. Arkan Dvarai, that is everything that we have to learn tonight with five minutes to spare. Once again, uh, this is the end of this year, but I will stay on for a few more minutes to address and clarify any questions that people may have. A lot of stuff still buzzing around, right? We're, we're up to 4, 4B next time? Next time we will be on 4B to the first power. Okay. Is that yeah. the thing, the first power? You know what I mean when I say that, right? 4B1, yeah, 4B squared, 4B3, the third power, just to help mm -hmm. people direct people. Okay, great. Does anyone have any questions before I log off? Thank you. All oh, right. Thanks, Thanks. 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 All right. Thanks, Shukar. Thanks, if anyone has any questions at any point, you're always welcome to reach out. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Shabbos, everybody. Hey, Rabbi. Do you have a question? Um, actually, I had a I had a thought that I was interested in running by you with regard to this Talmud class, or maybe uh, or maybe other things that you do. Um, have you heard of a new social media platform called Clubhouse? I'm uh, not, but I'm intrigued. Oh, okay. Um, has anyone else on this call heard about this? No? You remember like AOL chat rooms where you could just like go into different rooms and start like typing with people? Well, this is like the same kind of thing except it's with like audio. So you can like have conversations. And I think that this would be a really important platform for like Jewish thought leaders to start uh, sharing stuff. Um, it's, I mean, cause obviously it's open to the world, like people, pop in it's like just I don't it's kind of the new hot thing um and I've been really and I've been thinking about this in terms of this class um if you know if Rabbi Kurtz was interested so. 
Sorry, I didn't mean to like necessarily get everyone involved. It was just like okay. something I'm planning on bringing up. Well, you know, you have on here is a lot of committed people. Oh, Toby, you're muted right now. Hmm. You know, I, I think that- What would uh, that accomplish? That would accomplish bringing in other people who are not part of the sheer now? Is that the idea or? It could, I mean, it could be for the, I don't know. I, I don't know. This is, uh, this is Rabbi Kurtz's class. Like it's totally well, your- class. No, 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 but I'm saying like, what, yeah. what, what is the benefit it, it, of a platform like this? So my, my, I mean, my thought was it could be, yeah, it could be for a, if, if part of the appeal here was to bring it to a wider audience, that's something that like people are uh, particularly, I don't know if you're, you know, reaching a certain, I will put it a certain demographic, I suppose as well of tech savvy people who are like part of this exclusive community for now or whatever to do this. Um, it's, I, I would think it would increase buzz for Rabbi Kurtz, the Stanford community, et cetera. I don't know, it's like marketing, I guess, in, in a way, right? Like it's, I, I mean, you could use it for whatever you're you not need. just finding out about this year, you're actually participating in it on this platform, right? People can, I mean, you can do both. Um, it's if you someone moderates and um, and they I mean and they can allow certain people to speak. Um, I mean I don't know that it's necessarily good for this particular class if like this is much more of a conversation between just like the very committed people here. Um, but it's uh, you know, but other people can just also tune and it's almost like a live stream podcast. It's like that's what you're setting up basically. This would be open to to the general public. And it could be open to the general public. Again, then, don't know then, if Rabbi Kurtz is interested in making this available to the general public well, or if this is supposed to be a good I, I, I think there's a lucky problem with that lucky because problem. you're not supposed to teach halakha to non-Jews. Oh, well, Zadie, that's a whole separate shear. Oh, but, is that a, is no, that no, a problem? It's not, it's not a problem. I'll tell you why. It's a, it's a chuba of the three day ish. This is, you know, this is a good Monday night topic. Will God willing do in the future? Have a, have that documented actually teaching Torah to non Jews. Um, the idea is, you know, the issue that he had was there was a uh, a radio show in Israel and they teach Torah on that radio show. It's a religious station, so anyone could tune into it. The idea is that you're teaching a Jewish audience, and if someone non Jewish wants to tune in, then you're not said to be teaching to someone who's non Jewish. Also. Chances are if someone is tuning in, like, you know, who knows, maybe they're considering conversion. They want to find out about Judaism. So there's uh, that's a whole sheer unto itself. But Zay, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. Good thing to consider. Anyway, um, Jenny, that's, you know, I, I never heard of this, but I want to look into it. So um, it's called what again? Uh, it's called Clubhouse. I'll Clubhouse. send you I'll send you a, like a brief article I read about it. OK, so, I'm always right now it's an invite only. You, ju you just seem like someone who's like very tech savvy and tech forward and it seemed like something that might be a thing i'm always but, open to looking into new things so uh we'll, we'll check it out so please send it to an me. email offline okay great thank you so much all right yes yeah. you jenny and uh yes everyone have a great shabbos good night uh, everyone good shabbos everyone thank you thank you <laughs>